our relationship with food has never been more dangerous. One in four Brits are obese, while a staggering 1.6 billion adults worldwide are overweight. And an incredible 1.6 million of us here in the UK suffer from an under-eating disorder. In tonight's Super Size vs Super Skinny, we hear from an American who spells out the hell of living with obesity. I'm probably awake and conscious maybe of a 24-hour day, maybe six hours. Whilst back home, the treatment course for our anorexia sufferers gets much tougher. It's just, it's just, it's just like, I just don't need this. Oh, wow! Anna Richardson struggles with a boob workout. Oh. And entering our feeding clinic, Leighton the buffet slayer, and obsessive calorie counter, Lucy. I wouldn't think that's my worst enemy. They'll spend five days under the watchful eye of Dr. Christian Jessen, who'll make them face up to the real reasons behind their dangerous eating. It's no longer about what you're eating. It's now about what's eating you. A new week in the diet den brings two new swappers eager to change their horrific eating ways. Super skinny Lucy is consumed by the need to control her calories. And I guess maybe I am addicted to dieting, because like, it is what I think about. If we go out, it is the first thing that's at the forefront of my mind all the time, is what can I eat, what can't I eat? You know, I can't have an ice cream with the kids, or I can't have this because I don't know, you know, the calorie content, because I've done it for so long and this habit is just embedded in me. You know, it's, it's hard to break. What started as a post-birth diet plan has gone too far, and she's now at the mercy of the kitchen scales. The habit that I'm into now is, is, is the result of the diet that I did. It was, it was incredibly regimented. I weighed everything out, breakfast, lunch and tea, um, to know exactly how much I was taking in. And that's just formed this really bad habit of weighing everything and the need to weigh everything and know what I'm having. Luckily for Lucy, she's found our feeding clinic just in time. She's already undergone a full medical to ensure she's up to the challenge. Right, we're going to start off straight away. First up, Christian wants to see just how light 28-year-old Lucy is. 109 pounds exactly. OK. Lucy is 7 stone 11, which puts her in the underweight BMI range. I'm really concerned, actually, about your attitude and your control and your psychology about food. It's showing, really, some quite alarming signs. Everything is a, a thought process, a calculation, a calorie count, yes. a fat content count, yeah. Lucy dreads her daughter following in her footsteps. There is an absolute risk, I think, if I don't sort myself out now, that longer term it'll have an effect on her, and if it does have an effect on her as she grows up... Myself, if she grows up, has the same problems that I've had. Don't worry, Lucy. Some supersize help is at hand, in the form of Leighton, your new housemate. Leighton. Nice to meet you. Leighton tips the scales at 23 and a half stone, which is about three little Lucys. I'm the same size round as I am height, so you know. And to me, I would describe myself as an egg. As a hotel manager, he's first in line for the belly-busting staff buffets. Working in a hotel, I'm always, always surrounded by food and it's easily accessible. That's why I probably find that I eat. And shoveling down fatty takeaways at home help keep Leighton's weight on. Which is why we've booked a room for him at the fully inclusive feeding clinic. A BMI over 40 is morbidly obese. Over 50 could be fatal. Your body mass is 57.5. And morbidly obese basically means very, very high risk of illness and disease and actually death. Your heart rate's really quite high and you probably find that even with a short walk you're quite out of breath, sweaty, heart rate's going, yeah. which yeah. implies that you're just desperately, desperately unfit. At 27, single Leighton's desperate to meet someone, but always fails to get the attention he longs for. 
At my current size now, when I do go to a bar, I find it quite hard to approach someone because, you know, I find that they're not going to be interested in me, they're not going to sort of want to talk to me, so I just sort of find that it's easier to stand in a corner and be around my friends than sort of it is to sort of mingle and talk to people because I just think people are not interested. Leighton and Lucy are going to be swapping their polar opposite diets for five days in a radical approach to break their terrible relationships with food. Time for Super Size to meet Super Skinny. Nice to meet you. Uh, nice to meet you. I'm Lucy. My name's Leighton. Hi. By looking at her, I got the impression that, you know, she doesn't eat. My tiny little wrist. <laughs> <laughs> My lack of calories affect me and my mood swings. So with him eating that food, I'm worried for him that it might affect his sort of, um, how he feels in the house this week. Leighton and Lucy have provided details of a typical week's meals, and Christian is about to show them exactly what that looks like. Lucy, we're going to start with your breakfast. Let's have a look. What do you have the porridge with? Water. You have it with water? water yeah. Why not milk? It was a way of cutting back on calories. Let's have a look at lunch. So, pitta's filled with what, usually? A bit of lettuce, cucumber. So, it's very same in your diet. Do you have the same breakfast every single day? Yeah. Absolutely rigorously. No variety. No. Let's move on to dinner. What's that? Noodles, but spaghetti bolognese. <laughs> what happens if you go out for dinner or go to a friend's house for dinner? I'd always try and make up an excuse not to go. So, your diet actually restricts your social life quite Completely. considerably? Completely. But what do you snack on? Nothing. I'll fill up on water. It's water you use to curb your appetite. In a diet virtually devoid of red meat, fish or pulses, Lucy's only getting half the recommended amount of iron in her diet, meaning she could face anemia, which can lead to heart palpitations and lethargy. And her lightweight 1,000 calories a day mean Lucy is under-eating by three and a half days a week. Let's have a look now what you get through, shall we? Breakfasts. Let's see how they compare. Sugary cereal. Leighton, what happens next? Lunch? Talk me through lunch. Chips, uh, sausage roll, beans. Wow. Is that one meal? It's a pie, it's a burger, it's more chips. This is all sort of quite quick convenience food. They're looking absolutely terrified. Let's have a look at dinner. Looks exactly the same as lunch. Do you ever cook for yourself, Leighton? Very, very rare. More, two more burgery things. Cold slaw, full of mayonnaise, high fat, burgers full of fat, full of salt. Look at the difference already. Let's have a look at what you snack at. All right, here. You get through 1.3 kilograms of chocolate and biscuits and sweets every week. And crisps. Yeah. Are you shocked? Yeah. You're heading for disaster. The proportion of fat in an average man's body is 15 to 17 per cent. Leighton's body is an artery blocking 47 per cent fat. This is just oil that is in all that processed, deep fried food that you so love at your work canteen and that you eat at home. The average man needs two and a half thousand calories a day. Leighton is eating 5,400 calories a day, meaning he's overeating by eight days a week. That's not a year's worth of oil, that's weekly. I know I didn't have a healthy diet, but I didn't think it was that bad. Coming up, Leighton finds that getting to the bottom of his eating habits means going deep. I, I, was, I was prepared for the hunger side, but I wasn't prepared for the emotions of, of doing this. Lucy gets her teeth into her new diet. You see all that sort of grease coming out of that chicken there? Does that not make you think, I don't really want to eat that? And Anna gets abreast of what it takes to get beautiful boobs. It's making me feel a bit... <laughs> Let's face it, we're all obsessed with our bodies, weight and food. I'm Anna Richardson, and even though I've lost two stone in two years, I'm still not happy with how I look. All I see is imperfection. I've become totally hooked on getting the body beautiful. And if there's an easy, quick fix like Botox or teeth whitening, believe me, I'm up for it. But I've also signed up with a personal trainer to give my body the kickstart it needs and tackle my problem areas. Oh! 65% of women in the UK are unhappy with their breasts, and I'm no exception. In a bra? Good bra? Not bad! Out of a bra? 
I literally knocked my boyfriend out. What can you do? I can sweep the carpet with him. Boobs, like people, come in all shapes and sizes. But what makes the perfect pair of breasts? What makes the perfect pair of breasts? Medium and fan. <laughs> yeah, medium yeah. and fan. I am canvassing opinion. I'm interested. Small, pert and firm. Small, pert and firm. Thank you. Don't like big ones. No. Never had the opportunity, but don't like big ones. Well, I'll go for big ones. You go for big ones? Yes. The question is, what makes the perfect pair of breasts? Pert and symmetrical. I like pert and... Pert and symmetrical, so they just stand up without a bra. So most people seem to agree that pert is the way to go. But to me, pert and a 32F bra size is simply a contradiction. If I'm to get my perfect breasts, I reckon I'll have to try and shrink what I've got. OK, straight the cam. Saying that, glamour model Sam Cook has the same cup size as me, and hers seem perky enough, so maybe she can give me some tips. Wow, 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 wow! Now, Sam, right, your boobs are perfect, right? Thank you. <laughs> Mine are not. So what, what tips have you got to make them look as good as they can possibly be? It looks good if your nipples are a bit erect when you've got no oh, top on, because yeah. it makes your whole boobs suck up. Right. So I either do a bit of nipple twiddling or a bit of the old Coke cans. Have you got any exercises you can show me? Yeah, I've got a few. Right, I'm going to get my gym gear yeah. on. Hang on, hang on. <laughs> it's just like a press up. The further away you are from the ball, the yeah. harder it is. And then just drop. What's it doing to your knockers? Tighten them, give them a better shape. Uh, this is how the professionals do it, Sam. So <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh. How, how many have I got to do? 15. <laughs> oh, <God>. One. <laughs> Sam's boobs have been voted some of the best in Britain. And if exercise works for her, I'm going to get my trainer, Matt, to give me a boob camp workout. Get it? Boob camp? Never mind. Oh, whoa! Hang on oh, a minute. Yeah. That's that. really hard. Breathe out on the way out. Good. Keep the hips up and up it goes. Oh. I've been working out like a good un, but I'm still left with big boobs that are more pendulous than pert. Exercise only isn't going to slim down these puppies. The bottom line is the only option if you want smaller breasts is surgery, something I've often considered. Today, I'm going to watch an operation. But before I do, surgeon Mr Arnstein shows me what kind of results and scars can be expected after a breast reduction. Here's a lady who's you can see, is, yes. is very heavily breasted. Now, afterwards, here's the scars, and these are fairly early scars. Yes. The scar on the front of the areola is for on show, but much below that, hides into the fold. So all, all you really are going to see then, really, is just a little bit of scarring down, just down the front of the breast. All being well, it heals as a fine white line, but that's no certain that it'll happen like that. And sometimes you get stretched scars, sometimes they're red and lumpy and take a long time to settle, sometimes they don't settle. You, you could not be thrilled with that result. As I change into my surgical pyjamas, suddenly the reality of what's about to happen hits home. I am freaking a little bit about this. I have watched other surgeries, but for some reason this one is hitting home a bit more. I think it's because it's something that I'm genuinely thinking about. Um, and also, maybe it's something to do with the fact it's breasts, it's integral to being a woman, and you've wanted them all your life, and then suddenly you're going, bye-bye! So, yeah, uh, freaking a bit. Find out later how I get on observing a breast reduction procedure first-hand. Super Sizer Leighton and Super Skinny Lucy are about to embark on a five-day diet swap. It's the first dinner and a healthy stir-fry for Leighton, while Lucy gets a Chinese takeaway. Sweet and sour chicken balls, egg fried rice, spring roll, barbecued ribs, sesame prawn toast, oh, and chips. <laughs> How are you feeling? You know, I thought it would be really easy to just throw it down, but I suppose when you got when you're used to eating such a small amount with a yeah. small stomach to try and then Yeah, and because rice is quite filling on its own anyway. Eating Leighton's calorie-laden diet is a real challenge for Lucy, as she's kept her diet so tightly controlled for so long. But I need her to embrace the concept of the diet swap so she realises that she can eat more and that it's going to do her good. 
It's not long before it all gets too much for Lucy. Doing really well. I've had enough. Honestly, I think you're doing really, really well. But the hardest part of that was watching Lucy struggle. It made me feel, I don't know, a little bit guilty, I suppose, to think that, you know, I put her through that and made her feel that way. It's just grease. Just all it was in my mouth. Swimming is just a coat of grease. I wouldn't, I wouldn't feed that to my worst enemy. <laughs> but after a good night's sleep, Lucy seems happier to tackle a Leighton-style breakfast, chocolate and cola. Leighton isn't so keen on being given, well, gruel. I have to say, that was, um... Go on, be honest with me. Rather boring. I'd have rather had that. <laughs> and that chocolate bar. I did eat it, though, which is the best in last night's attempt. <laughs> That's true, actually, got an empty plate. I think I feel angry to the point where I've got a headache with it. So not just sort of stomach cramps, but I've got a little sort of mild headache, whether that's from the lack of food. You know, I'm feeling quite tired and starting to feel a little bit miserable now. And later on, he falls fast asleep on the sofa. Lethargy, breathlessness and loud snoring can be a side effect of extreme obesity. Leighton's ignored the many warning signs that his body's been giving him, and I don't think he realises just how much worse his health's going to get if he doesn't change his eating habits. He needs to see that this is not just a doctor's lecture, this is reality. Obesity cuts short the lives of 30,000 people in the UK every year. 1.6 billion people are overweight worldwide, including two-thirds of all American adults. In this series, we're turning the spotlight on eight morbidly obese Americans who are a dire warning of just how bad things can get. When you're this weight, there's so many ways to die. will affect every aspect of your life. Make the right choices in life. Don't wait till it comes too late. Don't take life for granted. Life is too precious. Don't wait until it's too late, because if you don't, you'll die. For these eight weighty US citizens, it's too late to turn back the clock. When you get this desperately ill, you're in trouble. But it's not too late for Leighton yet. And 36-year-old Edward from LA, who weighs 27 stone, wants to help drive the message home. He's sent a personal message to help Leighton understand he needs to address his unhealthy eating issues right now. As I was growing up, I was basically the only child in my grandmother's house. She cooked for an army, and she always cooked for an army. They didn't look at it like, well, he's gaining weight. It's unhealthy. They didn't think that it was such a problem. The things that I miss most are going out on a Friday and Saturday nights. Uh, you meet someone at a, at a club or a bar or you go for a walk. Uh, these are the simple things that I can't do anymore. It's a, a special kind of person that you're going to find that's going to want to hold your hand while they're walking and you're rolling down the street on a motorized scooter. Because I'm overweight, um, it caused me to get diabetes, and the diabetes resulted in me having kidney problems, uh, which caused a renal failure, and I ended up with edema, which means that I have swelling of the legs, and uh, I ended up with neuropathy in my feet. The neuropathy uh, basically means you can't feel anything on your feet. And I developed an ulcer on my toe. And that ulcer on my toe infected a bone. And um, they opted to uh, just remove the, the toe uh, to guarantee that I, it wouldn't infect the rest of my foot and, and end up amputating my foot or, or my leg. My kidneys are so badly damaged that I can't overexert myself. So I can't really be on my feet too long or I become very lightheaded. I'm usually always, always tired. I'm probably awake and conscious maybe of a 24 hour day, maybe six hours. Leighton, filling your time by eating now, you know, it feels good, 
but eventually you're going to end up in the hospital and there's going to be a lot of agony and sickness involved. If you can avoid that, wouldn't you want to? Don't let your weight get out of control. You'll definitely have a happier life and live a whole lot longer and a whole lot happier. Watching the video and you know, I can already relate to some of the things he said and you know, I think to the point where, you know, I do find that I'm sleeping quite a lot in the afternoon and, you know, already I'm finding a struggle sometimes to, you know, to go out walking with friends. But the problems are all exactly the same problems that you will experience if you don't change anything. You know, I, was I was prepared for the hunger side, but I wasn't prepared for the emotions of, of doing this. What drives you to eat, because it's not hunger most of the time, it's something else. And I think if you can get back in touch with those emotions, then you'll you're well on your way to changing them. Yeah. Leighton takes on Christian's advice, and with Lucy's help, he looks into his past to find a specific trigger point for his extreme eating. This picture, I'm about 12, 13 years old. That picture is probably around about the time where I really did start to question my sexuality. I wanted to be in a relationship. I didn't know if I wanted it to be a girl, if I wanted it to be a boy. You know, I was, I was really confused, and I think that's where I did start having meals in school and start snacking. I think I knew about the age of 17 that I was gay. By then, I'd already got into the stage of the snacking and the heating and, you know, going for the unhealthy options and having the pasty and chips and beans for lunch. You know, in this picture, I think I chose to dress up that year because I could make a joke of it and, yeah. you know, going out on the... You know, Almost going out on the... Yeah. I think I... Recently, I think, more, the more and more I thought about it, I think I do hide behind food. Until I came here, I never re really thought that my weight was a problem for me. You know, and I think definitely I'm realising that I do have a bigger problem with my... with the size than I sort of used to admit. Leighton now realises just how much his weight has affected his confidence. And now it's Lucy's turn to look into where her eating problems began after the birth of her first baby. What do you think? Can you see what I can probably see in that picture that I'm probably quite a bit bigger? So I don't, when I look at that picture, I don't see someone that's fat or you unattractive. You know, I think for someone that's just given birth, you look quite okay. You look really good, actually. I was probably quite obsessed with just getting the weight off as soon as I could. With everybody saying how good you look when you lose weight, it's really nice that people are saying it. So you just, I just kept pushing myself more and more without even really realising, I suppose. And I think that's where, you know, it went from being slim to being skinny, I suppose. Actually starting to look and think why I've gone from what I can see as my happy time to sort of now where I'm at a point where I think I didn't give my body a chance. I think I just took it way way over the top. Coming up, Lucy gets a shocking warning from Christian. Oh, it's disgusting. And our anorexia sufferers take on the nightmare of supermarket shopping. But it's just a fear that has just got bigger and bigger and bigger. Super Size Leighton and Super Skinny Lucy are three days into their diet swap. A new day dawns, but even though Leighton has had a breakthrough, it doesn't make Lucy's watery, low-calorie porridge any easier to stomach. Oh, it stinks. Yeah. It stinks really bad. So would you seriously have porridge seven days a week? Mm -hmm. Or we'd never have a change? Never have anything else? No, not really. The lack of variety in Lucy's diet is her way of keeping tight control over her calorie intake. But she didn't always have issues with food. Before Lucy had her first child, Katie, she'd been a healthy size 12 to 14, but her post-baby body made her desperately unhappy. The trigger with my weight loss was having my children and actually going on a diet, I suppose you call it. Um, and that's what I think started the whole thing with losing weight and then the need to lose more weight as people were saying I look good um, just keep thinking I'll lose a few more pounds I'll lose a few more pounds and then before you know it it's kind of it's out of, con out of control 
Lucy's rigid control of her diet comes from a deep fear of gaining weight. Christian's concerned that she hasn't grasped the reality of where her constant under-eating could lead, so he decides to show her. Let me show you a picture. Oh. Is that someone who actually is anorexic? It's disgusting. And who has, you know, purposefully under-eaten. It's skeletal. And the reason it looks skeletal is because all the muscle has just been you know, reabsorbed by the body in a desperate attempt for it to get some energy. My worry is that your level of control and paranoia over what you eat may well mask any sense of reality mm. so that you do get to that stage without even realising yeah. it. I can see it now and see that it is, it's not, I don't want to look like that. If my daughter came home looking like that. You'd be extremely worried, wouldn't you? Yeah. I can see now what everybody's been telling me. You just need to relax about your food. You need to enjoy it. You need to just let go a little bit. Yeah. I've come to really realise now, looking at myself a bit more, that skinny really isn't attractive. You know, it's not what I originally perhaps thought I would be able to get out of it. You know, having this really thin figure. I look at it and I don't want that now and I don't I certainly don't want my children growing up thinking that that's how they have to look. So I'm slowly starting to come around now realising that I can eat more and that it's gonna be fine. Ninety thousand people in the UK are being treated for an eating disorder, including anorexia nervosa. Ashley, Morag, Roz and Fiona are anorexic. They're on an eight-week course designed to challenge some of the key aspects of the disease as part of their road to recovery. I have forgotten what it's like to be normal. I think I can see it and I can almost touch it, but I can't quite get there. To assist our sufferers, we've recruited consultant psychiatrist Dr Peter Rowan and eating disorder dietitian Ursula Philpott. This week's task is a trip to the supermarket to help the group break their cycle of behaviour towards food and move away from safe and familiar choices. The group have all been given the same shopping list. Uh, a jacket potato. A cheese filling, not cottage cheese. Another filling of your choice. Spread, margarine or butter. A pudding, no fruit. None of the above items can be a low fat or diet option. An everyday task for most of us but not so easy if food is the enemy. The shopping list I've written today deliberately includes two higher fat items. Cheese and butter or margarine. They're items that the group wouldn't normally buy and so they'll probably find them quite anxiety provoking. I'm not a big fan of cheese, to be honest. I, I, you know, I don't really know how much to have or what kind of cheese I like. I'm just not got much experience with it, I guess. Being a mathematician, everything in Fiona's life is a numbers game. Um, once I've looked at the calories and something, that's it. I know it's in my head and I don't even have to think about it. Today is actually interesting because I'm trying so hard not to look at any of the numbers. I'm just thinking, um, what is something that I like? But then there's just so much choice that it's really hard to think of what I want. Supermarket shopping with Fiona is an absolute nightmare because we will wander up and down the aisles and she will pick things up and put things down and look at them and then think she's having them oh, and then she will put something in the trolley and then she'll take it out again because then she decides she doesn't want it and then by the end of the shop I find we have precisely two items for Fiona that were supposed to be a meal for that night and it is so frustrating. It feels very much to me when I'm walking around the supermarket like every decision is absolutely crucial and if I don't get it right then, you know, something terrible could happen. Shopping is something I, I, like, to, I like to have control of so I get what I want when I want, I suppose, and make sure that everything is to my specifications, yeah. So, 
everything on this list, bar a jacket potato, it sort of jumps out at me as something irregular. For 20-year-old Ashley, who's lost three and a half stone in three years, defying this dairy challenge is pushing him out of his comfort zone. I literally have no idea what's in any of this. I'm just... I just want to get out of here. Just get whatever I need and just... I don't really want to be here. To be honest. It's just... It's just... It's just like... I just don't need this. It's just in the way. I feel like I've got to fit this mould. Living with someone with anorexia, I think, a bit like uh, watching, you know, someone you love or whatever behind a big pane of glass, and you're watching them slowly destroy themselves, and you can't do anything to change it. You're forced to watch it. And nothing you say makes sense to them. But it's so frustrating. I need to do it, but it's, I'm literally only doing it just because I know that I should. I don't even... Forget it. Anorexics often have real difficulty in shopping for food, typically in supermarkets. They have a whole lot of conflicts in there. They're driven in a way by wanting food and wanting to eat and being surrounded by it. It's natural for them to be uh, completely looking at it in excessive detail all the time, how many calories are on it and so on. And at the same time, they're actually terrified to eat it and then the foods themselves are identified as frightening, and even going near them, picking them up, touching them, and so on, um, becomes quite a scary thing for some of them, and they will just keep away from them and not even go and venture close to it. For Ashley, choosing the cheese is proving a real struggle, so Ursula steps in to help him complete his task. What I'm wondering is, can we look at you choosing something different for your toppings, so that something that's not cheese, if that's easier? Yeah, mm -hmm. I mean, something that maybe mm -hmm. that I would actually enjoy. Absolutely, and that's fine. We can we can adapt it that way if that's easier. Yeah. So could I ask you to go back then and get a different chopping of your choice, something that you feel you would you would definitely be able to, to think about doing at home? That's yeah. fine, yeah. I literally wouldn't eat cheese because I don't enjoy it. I figured there'd be no use in me having cheese. So I thought beans were something that I used to enjoy, so I'll try them. I've got some chilies, some onion, some courgette. I need a tin of tomatoes and some cumin. Five and a half stone Roz is 37. Her family have lived with her obsession with food for four years. I don't think of Roz as being typically anorexic because she, she actually enjoys her food, uh, but it's just the intense focus on food and what she's eating what she's going to be buying from the shops, what we're going to be having for dinner. I love it. I love preparing foods. Um, I love cooking. Um, whether or not I'll actually be eating it at the end of the day, it's another matter. It seems that there's not much else in her life that is as important as food. I'm a perfectionist, I suppose. Can I, t can I just tell you what bothers me it, it, here? Um, it's when other things are on the shelves where they shouldn't be. Do you know what I mean? When people put things back where they don't come from, so that should be up there. And it just, I, I worry that that's got something in it that the thing that I'm buying might somehow absorb. For 36-year-old mum Morag, the condition is a little more complicated. Uh, describing anorexia without getting angry is actually quite a, a, a difficult thing. It's, it's like having a... Um, another person in the relationship, uh, a very petulant, difficult, temperamental person, because it it sets its own guidelines and it won't uh, countenance the idea of operating with outside of those those guidelines. My trolley is kind of split, if you like, when my things all go on one side and my husband's things all go on another side, just to kind of keep that contamination thing to a minimum. And having it in the in there and the cheese actually. It just worries me, really. <laughs> it's kind of a, a, a sort of system of beliefs I have built up over time, really, and I know that they are ridiculous, 
I'm, I'm well aware that, you know, things can't be absorbed into other things, but it's just a fear that has just got bigger and bigger and bigger. Some foods uh, that they will come across are really terrifying to them. Typically chocolate, cheese, those sort of high um, fat and often sugar containing foods. By the time they get home and they have to eat them, they may or may not actually find themselves able to do so because the terror by then builds up, the terror of what will happen if they do eat, and therefore they end up very often rejecting foods which they themselves have chosen at an earlier stage. Our courageous class have agreed to face that fear head on and take on their dairy demon. Buzz, how are you? How are you doing? The potato is quite large, but um, that's fine. I shall start it so I'll finish. It's nice to have something to, that tastes nice mm -hmm. um, and that you're hungry to eat. I'm surprised it's not as overwhelming as I thought it would be. You're not feeling too anxious or overwhelmed? Not as anxious as I thought now that I've started to <laughs> eat, so, yeah. Mm. The anxiety definitely comes in the preparation stages and afterwards I felt just, like, OK full, not overwhelmingly full. So I'm quite pleased with myself now, to be honest. As the group finish their main, Morag makes a breakthrough that gives everyone a boost. And Morag, I was interested to, to know how long it is since you've eaten a jacket potato with butter and cheese. Tens of years, not, you know, even... Sorry, it's making me... It's OK. Good, it's good, fine. Good. I don't, I'm, I, um, I'm sorry. No, don't worry, that's fantastic. It is fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> I know. <laughs> you, you've got, you had a really positive attitude about it as well, and you've done really, really well. It, it, I mean, it is a big deal. It wasn't crying because I was upset or anxious about what I did. It was um, tears of amazement and pride, I suppose, that, that I'd actually been able to do it, and that people were saying, you know, you've done really well. You know, people haven't said that very often to me um, and meant it in, in my life, so it, it really meant a lot. To, you know, to be supported. <laughs> <laughs> and Ashley, how's it going down? I feel bad for feeling good. Sure. <laughs> yep, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Welcome to the dark side. <laughs> <laughs> One thing I am trying to do is to just sit with feelings of anxiety. And I try and find, try and do things like I, I compare myself to a taxi driver who drove me here this morning. He said he sits in his car for 12 hours a day and he wasn't huge and he ate his bacon butties in the morning and I think, well, if he can do it, you know, I can. So... Supersizer Leighton and Super Skinny Lucy are nearing the end of their diet swap and they've come a long way. During a last outdoor picnic, Leighton contemplates the impossible leaving some of what's on his plate. Are you feeling full? Almost. Are you feeling full? I think I'll eat this and then I'll be full. Good. And I think I'll be... Oh, I'll be so pleased. And the opposite is true for Lucy, as she chows down like a trooper. That's going to be the first actual meal that you would have finished from... from every, they would have eaten everything. So I'm so annoyed I'm not realise it sooner. Before they head for home, Christian gives Leighton and Lucy their diet plans for the next 12 weeks. Let's talk a little bit about the diet plans, what you're going to be off on. And really, the emphasis on it is not restriction. You can still eat those things that you really like. You can still eat healthy food. But really, for both of you, it's about portion. So you're getting a bit more in your food, you're getting a bit less, but you're still both going to enjoy it, and therefore, I hope you're going to stick to it, all right? Let me give them to you. Here we go, Lucy, that one's yours. Leighton, that's yours. And all I can say, really, is best of luck. This is it. And I really hope you enjoy yourselves. And when I see you again, you're going to look healthier and happier and be well on your way to big changes. OK? Cheers. Thank you very much. You know, before I came, I always thought my problem was just my diet, and it hasn't been just my diet. And as the week has gone on, has made me sort of realise that and sort of think about why it is I do what I do and why it is I've sort of got into those bad habits. It's about respect for my body and, you know, not to fill my body with that crap anymore. All the best. Take, Take care. care. I'm going to go home. I'm going to carry on eating what I ate, but I know now, and I'm excited now, that I can eat loads more of it. It's just about letting that fear go. And actually, once it's gone, you feel so much better. Coming up, 
Anna gets too close for comfort to a breast reduction op. I can't bother, so, oh, I can still see it. And Lucy and Leighton return to the feeding clinic. You look amazing. Sixty-five percent of women in the UK are unhappy with their breasts, and for a while now, I've considered undergoing surgery to change what I was born with. So I've come to witness a breast reduction procedure to see exactly what it involves. They've not even started cutting yet, and already the smell and the whole ERness of it is making me feel a bit. <laughs> The first part of the procedure is taking off the nipples. They'll be sewn back on at the end of the operation. A bit hot and bothered. Oh, I can still see it. The surgeon then opens up the breast and starts cutting out the excess tissue. <sighs> By this point, I'm afraid that my journalistic cool has abandoned me and I'm a gibbering wreck. To my left, I've got two bags of human flesh. To my right, I've got a body minus two bags of human flesh. Really weird. Really, really weird. Once the patient has been sewn up again, minus those bags of flesh, it's time for the nipples to be reattached. The operation takes about two hours, and the patient was very happy with the results, but it's just too weird for me. I'm not sure what I was expecting, but I really wasn't expecting that. And having witnessed it and bags of flesh on the side, there's just no way I could go through that with my boobs. It makes me feel too weird. Um, so that's pretty much me done. I think I need a bit of a lie down. For one week, Leighton and Lucy completely swapped diets in an attempt to end their bad eating habits. After three months, they're back to see Dr Jessen to see if it worked. It was really difficult at first, but I knew why I needed to make the changes, so, you know, that spurred me on. I definitely know I've lost weight, and I can see it in certain parts of my body. I'm quite looking forward to getting that final weight in. Leighton, it's lovely to see you again. You absolutely do look smaller, shall we say. Thank you. Considerably, what did you find hardest to do? I think the hardest thing was breaking some of the habits. So, for example, sitting in front of the tally, being lazy, snacking. And how did you break those habits? I think it was from just determination, because this is something I've wanted to do and just needed something to give me that kick up the backside and give me that motivation that I needed. What were you hiding from before? I think probably myself. I always just thought, oh, well, you know, I'm big. You know, big people are generally known for being quite lively and bubbly, and I suppose I hid behind that and hid behind the habits and sit in front of the TV, whereas now I quite enjoy going out and much more confident, and, you know, I now know that if I really want to achieve something, I can. Lucy, it's good to see you again. You're looking a changed lady. Thank you. Feel it. Difficult three months or smooth yeah. sailing? Yeah, no, it has been, it has been really hard. Um, because really it wasn't just about the food for me, it was about overcoming the issues that were sort of going around in my head and the way I thought about food. So that was the biggest um, hurdle for me. Well, with you, it was all about control, wasn't it? And this, this very rigid control that mm. you had with what you allowed yourself to eat. Mm. Has that now relaxed somewhat? Yeah, absolutely. It was just the most amazing feeling and it really did feel, as corny as it sounds, it really felt like this big weight had just been lifted. When I think back to what I was eating, I don't know how I physically got through the day, and I think that's, you know, now I can see that's why I was tired, that's why I was irritable, and, and then it took, you know, just a matter of a week to just flick a switch, and now it's all turning around and it's fantastic. After 12 weeks, it's time for the pair to be reunited. Hey, look at Hello. you! Hello! How are you? Oh, nice to see you! Look at you! You look amazing! How are you, dear? Give us a twirl. Do you feel more confident? Oh, much better. Yeah, much better. I you? do too. Do you have more energy and things? Oh, like you wouldn't believe. Do you sleep as much as you do? No, no. My snoring is so much better. I can't really? butt, butt in. Good to see each other again? Oh, yeah, yeah, definitely. How do you think he's looking? He looks amazing. It's quite dramatic, isn't oh, it, I yeah. think? Yeah, absolutely. 
I'm, I'm very happy with both of you is the first thing I want to say, really, 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 because I think never have two people embraced this more and just worked out your own little personal issues and foibles and things and dealt with them. So, Lucy, it don't even look like that, really. I don't even have to pretend I'm happy. Six pounds increase. Really? Yep. Two inches round your tummy. That's great. And a whole different person <clears throat> altogether. It really, that's fantastic, believe me. This guy, in fact, I'll just go straight in. Three stone, five pounds you have lost. That's Excellent. impressive. And you've lost four and a half inches around your tummy. Yeah, I felt I got this more. Yeah, are you pleased with that? Yeah, definitely. It sounds amazing. I know, it's pretty good. I'm delighted, I really am delighted. Yeah. That's a real result. I mean, that's more than I expect for either of you, to be honest, so, you know, I'm a happy doctor. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. You're gonna keep this up now? Definitely. I'm really pleased, really, really pleased. You know, you think six pounds doesn't sound a lot, but to me, it's, it's such a big achievement. You know, 12 months ago, six pounds would have been the end of the world. And it, I'm just so proud of myself. I set myself a goal of being around 15 stone, um, you know, by sort of within the next eight months. So I think getting the results today has made me realise that, you know, I can achieve it and, and I'm going to achieve it. Next time on Super Size versus Super Skinny, it's Scott the Unstoppable Eating Machine. I just love food too much. <laughs> and food fascist Emma. Maybe I'm just a bit of a control freak. <laughs> the recovery course for our anorexics gets tougher than ever. That's not enough for a lunch. And Anna Richardson's quest for the body beautiful reaches the bottom line.